Welcome to Talking Success, the podcast series that focuses on everything fintech. I'm your host, Aaron Franks, and each week I'll be joined by a series of experts in the field who have a wealth of knowledge to share. It's time to meet this week's guest, so grab a coffee and let's start Talking Success. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Talking Success um, from a very bright yet cold Johannesburg this morning. Um, I'm joined by uh, Mr. Jamie Loden from uh, Diamond Trust Bank, uh, DTB, uh, over in Kenya. So it's great to have another perspective. Uh, we've obviously had Mark on from, uh, from MasterCard recently talking about some of the work that MasterCard are doing across the continent. And uh, we specifically spoke about DTB, as I have on another podcast, which if you haven't heard with, with Clayton from Ukesh, um, and that's where my sort of introduction to uh, to Jamie came from. So uh, um, Mark and uh, uh, um, Clayton from Ukesh introduced me to Jamie about a year or so ago. Um, we've been sort of chatting and doing some work together since then. Um, but I'm going to hand over to Jamie to give a quick intro. Um, appreciate his time on a Saturday morning. Um, so thank you, Jamie, for waking up early. Um, Jamie, welcome. Uh, give, give us a quick intro. Tell us a bit about you, um, how you ended up in, in Nairobi, and uh, what you do at the bank. Hi, Darren. Good morning, and uh, you know, thank, thanks for the invite. And it's great to be here and, and get an opportunity to share some, uh, you know, s- some of these interesting things we're doing. So, I've been with Diamond Trust now for about eighteen months, um, and uh, this so joined the bank at the beginning of twenty twenty two. Um, but this is my second sort of stint in, in Nairobi because um, I've previously been working across Africa since about 2010. So I, I used to be in the, uh, in the British Army. And when I left, I joined Barclays here in Nairobi and spent about five years doing a number of different jobs before moving to a short stint in Johannesburg. And then when Barclays sold Absa Bank um, and they sort of separated, I went back to the UK and continued to work on Africa, but from, from the Barclays side, just helping that separation. Uh, and then in 2021, I, I was asked to come and join Diamond Trust, which, uh, given their vision and the journey they're on, I was I was very sort of ex- excited to do. Amazing. So from uh, from officer in the army to chief operating officer in uh, in the bank, um, talk talk to us a little bit about what you guys are doing because uh, that is fascinating. And I know I've been sort of uh, waxing lyrical about this uh, pretty much to everyone I speak to and every uh, audience I get the chance to to talk out about what DTBX are doing. And I mentioned the X bit because uh, that's what I'd like to focus on a little bit today. Um, we will talk about the physical side of of, of the bank uh, and how you're rolling out to sort of the consumer. But can, can you give us a bit of an overview in terms of of DTBX, what what the X is, why that's come about, um, what the vision is that you just mentioned, and uh, where on that journey are you guys at the moment? Sure. Well, I mean, let me put it in the context of the whole thing. So, so Diamond Trust Bank is you know is, is a regional bank in East Africa. It's about seventy two years old, approximately, and covering Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and uh, Burundi, but headquartered in Nairobi. And you know what made it so exciting and why I was keen to join was the board had a vision of. Having seen the bank grow traditionally, um, you know, o- over those 72 years, up until the point where it became a tier one bank with more than 5% market share, there was a desire to sort of think about, okay, as we come out of COVID, what do we need to do to now really scale and grow and, and become a sort of competitive bank, not just in, as a tier one bank, but, but certainly in the top five banks in the country uh, and across the region. And that involved a combination of sort of physical expansion and digital transformation. And what particularly excited me was the digital transformation bit because, you know, those who know me well know I'm a bit of a sort of closet nerd on that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, it was just the sort of the willingness of the board to embrace a blank canvas and come up with an idea of of how they were going to do that. And so we've embarked on this journey. um, We call it our sort of five pillar journey, um, where we have sort of five key sort of strategic work streams that we're pushing in order to... um, you know, in order to achieve that digital transformation. Um, and the one to which you refer is, is really our our partnership with the sort of fintech community. Um, so that is, that is what we call our sort of digital partnership strategy. Um, and it is one where the bank is transitioning for the first time from being a, a, a traditional B2C bank into a B2B2C model. Mm-hmm. So we want to, um, we want to effectively extend embedded finance or financial services, or or you can call it banking as a service, um, but effectively breaking down traditional financial services and extending them uh, to tech-enabled companies. So not just fintechs, but tech-enabled companies uh, through effectively an API platform and uh, allowing 
those companies to then serve their customers. Um, and, and, and we're the sort of, we become the invisible but important banking financial partner. And uh, to do that, we, we've sort of come up with a, a sort of digital division for the, for the bank, which, which is what we're calling DTBX. And part of that is, is we, want to, we want to symbolize a sort of different thinking. So X factor growth, you know, uh, X, you know, the sort of the, the slight unknown, something that's slightly different. So that X really symbolizes sort of innovation um, and, and, you know, something different. And part of that is we want to make a distinction between what I'd call traditional banking, which tends to be, um, you know, very, uh, you know, whilst it's very important, it tends to follow a very traditional path in terms of um, the product lines and everything else are fairly well established. So, so whilst you might sort of subtly vary certain aspects of a product, you know, your marketing approach and the way you grow those are fairly traditional. With DTBX, it's very much a new venture. Um, and what we want to symbolize is, is this is we are trying to work and partner with fintechs. So we want it to be a different experience. We want fintechs to think of the bank as, as their digital partner of choice when it comes to financial services and one that is, one that is prepared to think differently. So, so how can we work together to solve a problem and, and really bring a solution to market where uh, it gives that, that fintech or tech-enabled company the opportunity to grow. But at the same time, ultimately what we're doing is, is, is we are extending financial services to customers. So, so for us, that helps us achieve our larger agenda of sort of financial inclusion um, and, and really sort of helping drive society sort of forward across East Africa. I'd love to get some examples of some of the fintechs you've kind of onboarded or you've got into the um, DTBX environment in a minute. But I think um, what what struck me when when we I think when we first met or maybe uh, a couple of times afterwards um, was was actually the plans for DTBX. And I think um, there's a lot of financial services institutions that talk about digital transformation and it's very much focused on the technology. So how do we use technology to digitally transform, which I get. But there is another piece and a, and a very important piece. I think, well, pieces. Um, I think one of them is what you guys are doing in terms of the um, the facility, the facility at DTB um, and how that is going to look and what that's going to offer. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, and well, I've obviously seen the plans and I, I, I wish I could kind of share them on here, but I'm not as tech enabled as you are. So I don't know how to do share screen. <laughs> so uh, if you can tell us a little bit kind of high level what, what that is um, yeah, and what so benefit cool. that has, I think, more importantly to the fintechs that are coming into, uh, you know, the DTBX ecosystem. Yeah, certainly. So, so, I mean, first of all, just to give a sense of, of the sort of scale. So, so we've currently got now we're up to we have 159 fintechs in our kind of pipeline community. Um, and some of those, so, so we've got um, 18 of those are at the central bank at various stages of sort of governance and licensing approval. Yeah. Um, and 13 of them are in a, within our sandbox who are testing and developing their applications ready to sort of take to market. So it's a fairly, um, you know, it's a fairly sort of strong pipeline of activity. And that includes some very, very small ones. Um, and because we're not exclusively focusing on large players, as well as some much larger companies. But in terms of the sort of the physical facility, we are building a, an innovation hub or, or, you know, some call it a digital factory, but, but either way, the sort of the concept's the same. And it really consists of probably three or four different elements. So first of all, it is a, a modern open plan collaborative sort of working space. Um, and that is, which will accommodate both our own sort of software engineering team and our, our own sort of digital team. But it also has a number of incubation spaces where if we're going to partner with a particular um, you know, uh, fintech to, to co-create on a product, we will be able to invite them to come and join with us to sort of base out of our factory, to work together and to use that space really to develop the product and to actually go through the sort of engineering and testing and so on. So one part of it is that is that sort of joint space um, and that sort of open space, which, which aims to sort of bring agile teams together. Mm -hmm. But as part of that, we're also trying to, um, and I've, you know, I've had a few interesting conversations with the CEO where I've said, look, you know, she needs to understand that, that uh, and, and Nassim, Nassim Devshi is extremely understanding of this. So, so, so I, I say it slightly tongue in cheek, but I said, you know, they will not be in there with suits and ties. You know, they will be in there in shorts and flip flops and T-shirts solving <laughs> problems. Yeah. And, uh, and we have, we have a laugh about that, but it symbolizes how DTBX is different from the rest of the bank, because whilst we are one bank and we are all working for, you know, for one overall goal, culturally, we recognize that we need to be prepared to be a little bit different to create that synergy with, with others. 
And as part of that, we're also building just things like um, we're building a, you know, um, a mother and baby room, for example, yeah. as, as part of the overall, um, uh, uh, you know, washroom facilities, because we recognize that the way that um, some of this kind of deep collaboration works when you're creating a product is, is, you know, sometimes the time of the day becomes irrelevant and people will work through the night, they'll work late or, or, or they'll come in late. And, and, you know, hours won't necessarily be nine to five. So we want to give people, you know, the ability to have the flexibility to embrace, you know, that sort of working space. So, mm -hmm. so that's one key aspect. So there'll be, there'll be full sort of cafeteria type functionality as well as washrooms that really allow people 24-7. So little showers will be in there and so on. So again, it, it, it will give people the ability to work there 24-7 if that's what they need to do or, or with the demands of the project drive them that way. The second aspect that I think is interesting is we are building um, a sort of video content and podcast studio setup because one of the things we will be launching or we are launching under the DTBX brand is, is very much um, a digital content sort of channel whereby we want to invite people from across the tech community and the fintech community to come in and talk about you know, some of the challenges they're facing, be they technological, be they regulatory, be they things about you know, talent retention, um, all of these sort of day-to-day -day challenges uh, and also to talk about, you know, not just just problems, but also exciting things. So the future of particular yeah. trends, and obviously, clearly at the moment, you know, AI is is the word of the moment. How are we going to bring that into the financial space? I think I think there's lots, you know, to be discussed on that front. So so there is a whole content creation uh, part that that will also sit there. And then the final aspect is is we are revamping our um, sort of. Our auditorium facility. So currently, we have an auditorium that is um, that can seat about a hundred odd people. Um, so it's quite a large facility, and it has um, you know fairly standard you know screens that you can connect computers to for presentations and so on. We're, we're changing all of that out. So we're putting in uh, effectively three large digital screens, um, which will allow um, uh, people who are presenting to have up to five different inputs at once. So whether you want five different laptops all displaying something different, whether you want supporting content on, on the sort of left and right screen and your main presentation content in the middle, um, you'll have the flexibility to do that. And in addition, um, we're, we're integrating video conferencing with in-ceiling microphones and so on. And, and our thinking process there is, is if we're working together with a fintech who then wants to pitch a product launch, whether that's to investors or whether it's to press and market, we're creating a facility that will allow them uh, yeah. to do that. So, so they can do it in a very sort of modern setting um, with, with, with some very sort of modern technology that will really actually create the right sort of sense of energy and so on. And I think we will also be looking to use that facility for um, sort of hackathons. And again, we want to start developing some ideas about how to do that, which are very much focused on problem solving. So, so yeah. we, will, we will work locally with... Um, uh, you know, organizations, be, be they sort of government, uh, NGOs, or, or even, you know, private companies to, to work out, right, what are some of the problems we need to try and address in the local environment? And is there merit in encouraging, you know, putting out a sort of announcement to say, actually, we're going to, we're inviting people who want to try and solve this to come in together and, and we'll sort of work out a way. How do we encourage people to, to come in and try and innovate solutions that are going to address some of these challenges that, you know, society is facing? Amazing, uh, it's, it's it's incredible. I mean, as I said, I saw, I saw the plans, and uh, it just looks it looks amazing, uh, especially for you know what's a seventy two year old bank um, to then sort of have you know podcast studios and YouTube studios and uh, you know uh, these these kind of facilities for for women with babies. I think it's just just incredible. Um, Let's talk about some of the support that you give to fintechs. So you, you've, you've got the facility, which is amazing. Um, so let, let's talk through a, a scenario where I'm a fintech. I have an idea. Um, I have a concept. And obviously, I need a banking partner to be a, maybe it's a payments platform. Maybe it's a lending platform. Um, and I approach DTB and I, and I say, Jamie, listen, I've got this, uh, got, got this idea, got this concept. Um, I need a partner. Um, what do I do next? Do I have to have a certain level of funding in order to come into the environment? What is the cost involved? What's the process? H how does it work? Scott, could you design a video game? I could make you a hypothetical one. If I took some random genres, mechanics, maybe blended them together and uh, created a new hypothetical game. Now that would make a great podcast. Undoubtedly. So what do you make? Something original and exciting? 
A Dark Souls city builder? A co-op roguelike? Everything. All of that. You know, we could use the Nemesis system from a, and put it in a first-person shooter. And we could have a loot system with survival mechanics and, and motion controls. And maybe you could... Oh, I don't know, it's save a kingdom from some out of control toasters. You know, uh, what about party? Catch the Gaming Blender on all your favourite podcast platforms. So, so it's a great question. Um, so, so the first thing that happens is, is you know, we'll, we'll have a sort of meeting and understand the idea, the vision and so on. Um, funding isn't really a consideration at that stage. It's more understanding the opportunity, the idea and 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 you know, how advanced it is. Um, but effectively, we will then sign an NDA mm -hmm. um, with the FinTech. And, if, and, and at that point, we start to go through a journey. And again, depending on the maturity, it can be, you know, it can be quite quick or it can be quite long. So, so I what we tend to see is, uh, you know, FinTechs that are post-Series A tend to be much more mature and it's, and it's very quickly, they want to understand what can we offer them from a technical perspective and, yep. and then how do they, how can we help them navigate, you know, any sort of regulatory issues. Um, I think for those that are slightly less mature, it's more about um, it's creating that trust partnership. So, so, so the bank becomes, you know, the trust agent for the fintech where actually we now have a relationship where we are guiding that fintech through the regulatory journey of compliance. We're explaining to them what are the minimum standards they need to um, meet and how do they do that and how we will help them with that. But at the same time, we are ultimately the, the sort of custodian of those regulatory standards. So, you know, the central bank make it very, very clear to us that, that if we're partnering, we're responsible. So it becomes a journey where of, of sort of mutual trust, where we need to guide that fintech and they need to respect the sort of, you know, what, what, how we're saying to them is this is what you need to meet. Um, and then after that, it really can be any number of things. So, so it can be either we're working together to create a product because in some cases we have perhaps more structured ways of doing product development that, that a fintech might not necessarily lack. So we can guide and advise on that. And in other ways, it's, it's merely, it's far more technical whereby they've got an established product. They, they see an opportunity to take advantage of the technical capability we're offering in order to perhaps scale that product or to meet a different customer segment. Yep. And really it's, it's about working with them to extend the technical capability to help them uh, get into our sandbox, start testing and developing, and, and really get to a point where they're ready to, you know, to expose that product to, the, to their new sort of customer or segment. So there's a whole flavor that can be in there. Um, mm -hmm. And at, at the moment, we are, you know, we're happy to sort of work with, with all, all types. And then in terms of the support that you give for, uh, put the regulatory side, uh, regulatory piece aside for the time being, but from the uh, the product development, um, from the engineering side, are, are you actually offering sort of engineering support to, to these fintechs if, if they are sort of relatively early stage and perhaps they don't have, you know, a full tech team? Um, are, are you offering sort of engineering? Is there a cost to that? How, how does that work? So, so we at the, at the moment we're not offering engineering. Um, that's not that's not something we've sort of got to. I, I wouldn't rule it out. Yeah. Um, the closest we've come is we have one partner who we are co-creating a product with. So, so, so um, there is a joint uh, sort of effort in terms of the, of the dev product development cycle. Um, and, you know, that product is actually uh, on its way to the central bank now for, 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 for approval. So, so we're oh. hoping to be able to launch that soon. Um, I think with, you know, in our experience in, in engaging with FinTech so far, Engineering support isn't so much the challenge for them. They, they tend to have their own engineers. It, it's, it's far more weighted towards the regulatory compliance aspects, you know, because, you know, fintechs don't, you know, the, you know, often they are relatively young startups and so on. And, you know, and in fact, Clayton on his, you know, on, on his chat with you on here, you know, said the same thing when they started, you know, they're exposed to a number of things that were just completely new territory in terms yeah. of anti-money laundering legislation and requirements. Whereas for those of us in the banking industry, it's our bread and butter. It's what we deal with every day. And so, you know, the frameworks we have are tried and tested and being developed over many, many years. They're subject to inspection by auditors internally, externally, as well as the central bank. And so we're fairly confident in the frameworks in which, that we operate. Um, and so we're able to leverage that to help guide. And I think whilst engineering remains a possibility in the future, it's much more, at the moment, the emphasis is much more on that compliance sort of landscape. Okay. But at the same time, because we're the ones providing the platform, there is then also a degree of technical support, not so much in engineering, but more once, once they're live 
and if they have any challenges or they want some configuration changes in the way the platform is operating to support what they want to offer to the market, then then we would be able to provide that. Um, so if I was a fintech and I was listening to this, I go, this sounds really cool. What's it going to cost me? This sounds like really expensive. Um, how, how does it work from a fintech perspective? Do they have to pay to come into the environment, into the sandbox, or do you do this based on you know future revenues in terms of transaction volumes or whatever their commercial model is? How, how does that work? So we have a standard sort of commercial model, which is based on transactions. Um, okay. And depending on the nature of the service that the, the fintech wants to consume, we will then discuss what, what you know what the pricing you know looks like. But effectively, you know there are uh, if they're to go live on the Astra platform, then there are you know there are sort of residency fees, and then there are per transaction fees and so on. So so the key thing that we understand and we're sensitive to is. We can't make it cost prohibitive. We can't make you know we can't put a an entry barrier that, that sort of keeps people out because yeah. so many of these organizations start slowly but then scale rapidly. So so you can't you know you can't do it in a way that, that you create a, an entry barrier. Um, and and part of that initial discussion after we sign an NDA is, is very much developing that commercial model. Okay. Um, so, so of course, sadly, you know, it's not for free. <laughs> no, um, sure. But but, uh, but you know, we are you know, we're, we're sort of we do our very best to be understanding to the challenges of, of getting a new venture off the ground. Great. Um, bring it back to, to the uh, the regulatory side. So, um, once uh, a fintech's been through the sandbox, um, has with your support gone to central bank got a license or whatever they need in order to operate. How do you as DTBX ensure that um, those regulations are consistently met? Because I think it's, you know, I'm not saying it's quite easy, but you can go and get sort of, uh, you know, certification and then you come back and go, right, well, okay, I've got it now. Now I can tweak this or turn this off or, or do whatever. How, how do you ensure that there's regular compliance? So, so a couple of, a couple of ways. Um, the, the most obvious way is we have system enforced Controls. So, so, so you cannot, um, for example, if you were to, you know, if we talk about a fintech who wants to you have a wallet on the platform, um, the wallet can't be opened without the KYC conditions being met. Right. Um, and that's a, that's a sort of that's a system enforced control, which means that that they can't develop their app to bypass that. It, there's, you know, the back end just will not allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. So there is a degree of sort of system enforced control, um, but then we also have an assurance requirement whereby we will be. You know, we will continue to audit and and um, and, and sort of uh, check on things ourselves, just to you know, so that we can demonstrate to the central bank that that we are taking our responsibility as the ultimate custodian of regulatory um, compliance very seriously. Um, because the you know the greatest risk for us is for us to be found wanting from a compliance perspective, because effectively at that point, you know, the platform could be uh, we could be told to sort of you know, uh, shut it down or, or sort of, you know, or shut down a particular partner who's on the platform. And, and that's in nobody's interests, you know. Right. So actually, if everybody's working together to ensure we're compliant and we're satisfying the regulators that customers are being protected, because ultimately that's what it's about, is, is you know, protecting customers' rights um, and also at the same time making sure that we're not creating any loopholes that can be misused for any nefarious reason. Sure. So providing we're doing those two things, then, then, then I think everyone can be comfortable that we're, we're meeting the requirement. Um, and we take it seriously. And how have things change from a um, sort of cybersecurity, info security side in the bank? Because again, you know, making this this transformation or on this journey, um, you I, I would imagine I, I'm not the expert, but exposing yourselves uh, as a bank to uh, you know you've got API platforms now, you've got sort of people coming in. Um, how do you how do you ensure that sort of that security layer? Because it, it must be a, a big challenge. I know there's lots of hacks that, that go on sort of globally, but um, th there's been quite a few. Well, quite a high number of uh, sort of malicious attacks in, in Kenya over the last couple of years. Um, how are you guys mitigate, mitigating against that? And is that a consistent sort of whack-a-mole challenge or how does that work? Um, so it, it's, it's uh, you know, I mean, cybersecurity, like, almost like physical security, you know, continues to be an evolving landscape. Yeah. And um, I think the difference is that the cybersecurity landscape evolves much faster than the physical one. Um but the basic tenants are the same in as much as there are various domains within the security landscape that we consider holistically and we are continually sort of ensuring that the solutions we're deploying are fit for purpose across those domains. So we don't rely on any single one layer. Um, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of series of layers. 
And I think perhaps most importantly, um, we continue to use a series of um, you know, penetration testing techniques where we test the security ourselves, both, both from an internal perspective, but also from an external perspective to ensure that um, we are um, making sure that that any vulnerabilities, you know, are addressed. And, and, you know, you raise a good point, you know, APIs are by, by the very nature that they can be called, you know, are, are sort of open to sort of being misused, but, but we have some solutions that monitor that and alert us to, you know, to any sort of such attempts. So, you know, whilst I think, you know, you can never, you know, you can never be, um, you know, you'd be foolish to sit back and think you're, you're foolproof. I don't think anybody is. It, you have to constantly, be uh, engaged on this and making sure, you know, and, and effectively carrying out your own uh, regular assurance to make sure that you're addressing any potential gaps. Uh, and we've got a pretty robust program to do that. And I guess that, uh, yeah, it's probably enhanced slightly given there is now the digital side, but security has always, I, I imagine, been, you know, the, the sort of the, the primary thing of anything when, when it comes to banking. I was talking to, uh, actually, I did a podcast the other day with uh, Chuck Tawanda and uh, he was saying, you know, a bank is basically, you know, if you, if you define a bank, it's about trust. You know, a bank is trust, um, and you have to ensure that you know that you fully trust that bank. We were talking about some of the digital wallets in, in the UK. I know we, uh, we we we're both Revolut customers, and uh, yeah, it's great. Would I put my life savings in there? Absolutely not. Um, not that I've got any left, but uh, anyway, that's a whole other subject. But um, uh, the um, uh, you know, I think it, it, it is about trust. I, I, I just want to bring this back because there was a, a point you mentioned a bit earlier on about, uh, I know you said it a bit tongue in cheek about sort of fintechs coming in in sort of flip flops and backwards caps and, uh, you know, I don't know, whatever else, you know, these fintechs wear these days. Um, from, from a change management perspective um, and from a cultural change, um, I know you'll see her. We, I've had the pleasure of, of, of meeting her once and uh, she's, she's clearly fully on board. Um, but I imagine there there's probably other parts of the bank that, maybe a little bit resistant or a little bit skeptical over, you know, what this whole new fintechy thing is. Um, how, how do you overcome that? And, and is, is that a journey or is it just a case of you carry on with your traditional bank and we're going to do this or is there amalgamation? How, how, how has that worked? Working? So, so I think, it, you know, it's definitely a journey. Um, yeah. it, it's, you, you, you can't sort of, you know, any transformation journey, um, is, is, you know, has cultural friction points, which you can't solve overnight. But I think, I think for me, the main thing is it, it's, it's bringing, you know, everybody on board, you know, you know, along that journey. And, and I think, um, you know, understanding that, that this is, when I, when we say this is the future, it, it doesn't mean that it's the future exclusively and that the rest of the bank is going to wither and die. It, it's absolutely not. And I think, to go back to you know wh where we started, you know our physical expansion is extremely important as well yeah. because when we look at our customer base, what we see is we have significant numbers of customers who who really place tremendous importance on that day to day physical contact, and so hence you know we uh, you know when I joined the bank we were sort of sixty two branches and we plan to be at one hundred by sort of early next year. So so we're already now um, up to seventy two. So we've op op opened ten. Uh, and, and we've got several more that we're going to open in, in, in the sort of later part of this year. And I think um, what we see is, is, you know, when we went through COVID, you saw um, everybody moving to sort of digital only transactions. And I think mistakenly, perhaps some thought, right, that is now the future. We, you know, it's going to be very much digital only. But actually, since coming out of COVID, what we've seen is declining numbers of digital transactions and growth in, in branch transactions because... Many, many people want to, you know, they want to have that physical contact. And it's not necessarily just physical contact with, with the bank's staff themselves. It's also the other people they meet. So, so for many, you know, they, they work on a, you know, they're very much, um, they're, they're li their lives are sort of uh, predominantly lived in their local communities. So they see other people in the bank. So there is a social interaction that, that takes place there over and above the actual banking transactions. So, so in many ways, you know, the bank is, is acting as a community hub in, in certain respects. And mm -hmm. so we're not going to, you know, the traditional bank is not going away. If anything, it's growing and it will continue to grow. And I think what's interesting is, you know, whilst the digital side will grow and will serve a sort of different customer segment, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. It's, so internally, to, you know, to address your question, um, I think, think, yeah, there are some people who, who do wonder perhaps what is it all this excitement about? 
Um, but but we are doing our, our best to to actually bring everybody on the journey and to you know to make it clear that that whilst we might have a separate brand DTBX for all our digital activity, the mother brand that everything relates to is Diamond Trust Bank. That overarches everything, and um, and and we, we won't lose sight of that. And and I think you know one of the things we're doing is we ha- we have a sort of an educational program on sort of agile um, and and you know, digital sort of transformation and, and sort of design thinking and those types of activities that I think, you know, as we permeate that through the bank, it will, it will people will start to realize that this is just a different part of the bank, but it's still part of the same bank in much the way that, that perhaps, you know, business banking deals specifically with a segment called small, medium enterprise and so on. But it's not exclusive to either retail or, you know, large corporates. It's just mm-hmm. another division. And, and, and I think it's, you know, we we will make sure that everyone understands that because, you know, the synergy that we get internally is important. And actually, we've been quite successful in we've had a number of people uh, transition from the traditional bank into the sort of the digital team. So they bring a lot of experience, particularly around product development that they're now starting to apply in that space. Um, so, 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 yes, it, it's, you know, we're all one DTB family that driving this. Amazing. Uh, two quick questions. Um, first of all, is, is there a consumer um, app as well? Is there, is, is there a, is there a digital um, part of DTB that a consumer can have? You, you mentioned obviously 100,000 new customers this year. Um, you've mentioned the, the, the branches going up to 100 branches, but is, is there also the ability for consumers to have sort of mobile apps uh, for the bank or is that part yeah, of Yeah, so, so, so we currently have a, um, a, a sort of mobile channel application for, for yep. our sort of uh, customers who are traditionally banked. But we're in the process also of developing uh, a, a sort of digital application that will um, go much further in terms of extending different financial services to customers and for those that want to, to largely be able to live with a digital account, um, you know, only uh, mm-hmm. that, that is effectively accessed through that app. So very much in the, in the style of, of, of some of the others, um, such as, you know, Monzo and Revolut and so on. So it's a heading down that path. Yep. Um, it's something that's in development, but we're looking forward to launching it you know, in the future. I've been told that's called bundling, rebundling services. That's what I've been told it's called. Uh, anyway, uh, my, my other point was, um, you, you got me thinking when you just said, you know, uh, actually where, where people come to, to bank physically, uh, it's that kind of opportunity to meet and greet people. And I don't know, for some reason, I just thought about my butcher here in uh, in Johannesburg. And, uh, you know, during COVID, you know, you, you do an online food order and you don't really know, you know, what, what you get. You order some chicken, you order some, some meat and it, and it arrives. And I think going to a butcher, uh, having that sort of conversation with the butcher, saying, oh, I really fancy doing something like this. And then you meet other people in there and they say, oh, have you thought about doing this? And, um, you know, I, I, I think that whole sort of post-COVID thing now, people want to be more social. Um, people, I think, really Really suffered during that period of time and you know if you look at sort of fintech and financial services yes there's obviously you know a big push towards digital but um that, that sort of um uh, uh mirage of you know yes it's physical yes it's digital but how do we merge those two together i think it's it's really interesting there's a there's a new bank here in south africa post bank um that's going to be launching and, and and they're going purely branch um which is interesting um so we'll see how that one rolls out but uh yeah um jamie thank you uh it's saturday morning and i'm sure you've got better things to do than talk to me so uh i'm gonna let you go but i've thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed the conversation um if anyone wants to sort of learn more about dtbx uh and the journey um website the best place linkedin linkedin is the best place so so we have uh dtbx has its own um you know we we have a handle on 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 uh linkedin for dtbx yeah people can reach me directly on linkedin as well and uh yeah happy to hear from anybody amazing um thank you uh it's a fascinating journey and that's a wrap for this week's episode of talking success Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us for this fascinating discussion on all things fintech. We hope you've enjoyed this episode and have gained some valuable insights into the ever-evolving world of finance and technology. A huge thank you to our guests for sharing their expertise and providing us with some amazing insights that we certainly couldn't have done this without them. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and stay tuned for more exciting conversations with experts in the field. Until next time, keep learning, keep growing, and keep talking success.